to welcome the panel pre presenters and the moderator, Weatherly Bates, with Alaska Shellfish Farms to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. So nice to see all of you here and the enthusiasm for mariculture. Here we have a great group of dedicated oyster farmers. Um, let's welcome them. This is Maida from Salty Lady Seafoods, Siwan from Simpson Bay Oyster, Jacinda from Hump Island Oyster, and Thomas from Seagrove. Um, so first we're going to have um, a presentation by, I think, Siwan. Maida, sorry. Oh, see you on. <laughs> oh, what do I do? Okay. You just push it. Okay. And you need to change it. Beautiful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Siwan Gelbach, and my farm is Simpson Bay Oyster Company. Um, my husband and I own this farm that is about 12 miles outside of Cordova uh, in Prince William Sound. Um, as you can see, uh, it takes about 30 minutes for me to get there by boat, and um, that's, you know, sometimes it's a nice ride, sometimes it's less so, but um, anyway, uh, this farm location was chosen uh, on the advisement of a longtime oyster farmer in the area, and um, it's out of the wind. And uh, when we were talking about the right spots for agriculture, uh, for you know, citing oyster farms the other day, um, you know, my, my farm doesn't fit into all those definitions. Um, it's deep, it's 100 to 200 feet, the whole farm. And, um, but it's out of the wind, and that has been a good thing because it gives us more workable days. Um, so I also would like you to know this, um, <laughs> the grayness of this image. <laughs> uh, so last summer in Prince William Sound, it didn't get over 55 degrees until July. So we were working in the rain <laughs> and the cold. Um, anyway, let's see here. Uh, so the first oyster seed went on my farm in 2019 in suspended stacks of wire mesh grow out trays. And our gear choice is based very much on the predators in the area. We have a high density of sea otters living in Simpson Bay. So uh, definitely an important consideration for farm development. Um, and that lesson was learned by previous oyster farmers in the area. <laughs> Um, so ours is a small production farm. I have about 120,000 oysters on the farm currently. Um, my first harvest was in 2021. Um, and uh, so my primary market is in Cordova. I have sold oysters into Anchorage, Yakutat, Valdez, um, but I really mostly enjoy supporting my local community. Uh, they all love to eat seaweed, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> seafood. Uh, they eat seaweed too, but I mean, Cordovans really just eat all seafood and loads of it, it's just awesome. So um, I'm sure coastal communities are pretty much that way, but that's uh, been a good thing for me. I really, what you see here is a picture of um, an Earth Day sale where I did a joint sale with Noble Ocean Farms. So Sean and Skye's farm is very close to mine and a uh, shout out to them. It's, it's really good to work cooperatively cooperatively with other farms around you. So, um, yeah, um, let's see. Um, but in order to make my farm economical, I really have also had to branch out. Um, and so I would, um, you know, it's really important to also find other ways to make money. Uh, so I've been doing oyster farm tours, which have been popular. And then also I'm involved in the uh, Mariculture Research and Restoration Consortium project, the Maricon Reach, <laughs> the Mar Recon project. It's got a big name. Um, and that is an EVOS funded project that's managed by the Prince William Sound Science Center. Um, so I just, if you have a farm or you're uh, thinking about having a farm, it's really important to find other sources of income because it's a business and you need to, you know, 
there, there, need, there are high expenses and, and you really need to think about um, diversifying the income for your farm. So anyway, I've enjoyed sharing the farm. Oh, shout out also to um, Brian at UAF who sh um, shared these underwater pictures, which um, I've been excited about having them dive at the farm. So anyway, lots of critters. <laughs> um, okay. Where's the pen? Um, yeah. Um, and so the word that's missing on this slide, I would say, is love, because uh, the joy of oyster farming, it's also a lot of hard work, um, so you better love being outdoors, working on the water. Um, I really love bringing other people out to my farm. This is a, these are pictures of my crew this last summer. Um, you know, when you give people the opportunity to work uh, in the environment, uh, they're going to care more for it, and they're going to be better stewards of it, and if I can bring that up in my community, ooh, it's something I care about. <laughs> uh, my voice is getting shaky, but anyway, um, you know, that's really important. It's all about building up our communities, right? And uh, so that's a lot of why I do this work. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Siwon. Now we have Maida. Hi, I'm Maida, and I own Salty Lady Seafood in Juneau. We are about 26 miles north of Juneau, probably a little closer to Haines than we are Juneau, and just three miles shy of the end of the road. Uh, we run a one-acre total oyster farm. Half of it is actually growing oysters, and the other half is um, an intertidal parcel that we're hoping to work out some plans for um, with NOAA trying out some gear and um, maybe rack and bag system. But we are um, basically a really little farm with a lot of heart. <laughs> and we've got about a million oysters on site right now. Um, we use a combination of floating bags um, that we spend a lot of time touching and flipping and pressure washing. Uh, and then we've also got two work rafts um, that we're able to do a lot of our handling and tumbling on that have two grot rafts with suspended um, stacks, so we're able to utilize more of the water column. Um, so we try to use both methods so that we can get like a nice fundamentally deep cup as oysters are younger and growing, and then we move them to stacks when we're looking for a good burst of growth. Um, and there's always a lot of challenges with farming. Uh, one of them that all of us face, regardless of where we farm, is fouling. And we happen to be in a mussel bed, so every year we battle mussels. Um, the photo on the left is a spring stock that's been pulled up and it peels off like a carpet. And then one of the things we learned this year was we had about a three-year life cycle on our moorings. And so piece by piece, equipment started breaking loose and arrays broke loose. We had a um, boatload of seed that we were going to run out to the farm. And when we got to our skiff, it was beached because the mooring had broke. So we had to wait for the tide to float it again and push it out. And then um, another huge challenge this season has actually been harmful algae. Um, we spent the majority of June and July, really, it was June 6th to, to um, July 26th shut down for PSP this year. And then we had another closure again that was September 25th to October 12th. So for those of you that are fast with math, that's 73 days, 10 and a half weeks of a 20-week season that we spent shut down. And I'd say one of the biggest challenges with that is obviously like lack of money. Like you have to have money to run a successful business. And then also our crew is incredibly important to us. Like our farm couldn't operate without an amazing group of people. And so being able to pay for crew involves income. And without that, you're really just hemorrhaging money to keep people on. And we had to lay off some folks and it was really painful. We had a girl fly out from the East Coast to take a job at the farm and I didn't, she was going to do our processing and I didn't have any product for her to process. And so that was really sad and hard. Um, but even though we've had a lot of challenges, this year has been another amazing year with beautiful partnerships with the university especially at a time where we need to know as much information as we can about harmful algae. We have 
um, students coming out to the farm each week. They do phytoplankton tows. They tell us about what's in the water. Um, you know, it provides a lot of opportunities for research for students at the university. And in a time where we have no income to pay for labor, it's a really great fit for us to be able to bring students out who are eager to learn about mariculture. They're eager to get some time out on site, working outside of a lab, get hands-on experience. And then it, it just works out as a good trade because we still have to handle our product, even if we're not selling it. It needs the touch. It needs to be washed. It needs to be sorted. And so having people coming out there, um, um, has been really huge. And then on top of that, the university has really introduced us to a lot of incredibly smart, capable, able-bodied, enthusiastic young people that are excited about mare culture. And, you know, I started my farm with the hopes that I could really kind of shape my kids' childhood and provide them with a unique experience growing up in Southeast Alaska. And I'd say one of the biggest pieces of that um, puzzle that I didn't anticipate was just how much my kids would be shaped by the relationships they get to build with these students from the university and they're all pretty incredible people that come out and then they end up taking on jobs at the farm and working for us and becoming a part of our farm family um, and so we have been lucky in that we've had a retained relatively similar group of people that comes out that cares about our farm that cares about our family that cares about our product and in turn, having this amazing group of people be a part of our team, it really, for my kids, it makes it so joyful. It makes the opportunities for growth and enthusiasm. They just feel that and it shapes the culture of our farm in a way that instills a sense of pride and confidence in my kids. It rubs off, they're excited to go to work, they're excited to be a part of a team. And then I have a nine-year-old who is excited to just swing at the farm and hang out and wash the docks and hang out with the ladies doing research or do whatever she wants all day, basically. She ca kayaks around and sorts seashells and, um, yeah. And then beyond our beautiful relationships, it's been kind of amazing to have a small farm in the sense that we put so much time and attention and love into our product. We are a very little farm, but... We touch our product a lot. We handle it a lot. You know, we we produce an oyster that we feel really good about. You know, we, we love what we sell. We love what we do. And I feel like it shows in the quality of the product that we sell. And to have my kids be able to truly understand the farm-to-table model and help seed oysters and handle and touch them and harvest them and then take them back and help me pack them and actually... I have a 16 year old now and he goes and drives and does the deliveries, does the drops, picks up the checks. It's just been such an amazing opportunity for them to have this um, job experience that I feel like would be really hard for somebody that's not your mom to give you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in some ways, like I wouldn't have asked another 13 year old to come and do the things that I asked and expect my kids to do. And so they, um, they do gain a lot from it and beyond all of that. They have a remarkably huge family and a huge group of friends that they feel so proud to bring out to the farm and they're just always looking forward to the days off where they get a swim and kayak and paddleboard and we tow a kneeboard around the cove with my work skiff and um, they feel so proud to be a part of a family and a business and a community. They love bringing their friends out and sharing that with them. And then just for fun, I have a video for those of you that know Surf's Up. You'll recognize the reference, hopefully. And um, it kind of just shares a little bit of insight to the joy and goofy funness of the vibe out at our farm with our crew. And hopefully you guys enjoy it. These are my ladies. This is Jill. This is my lady, Amy. Little Susie. Brianna. You know why we call her Brianna, right? No. Yeah, it's a long story. Shaniqua, Helga, Miss Kitty, Jeannie. I dream of uh, Teresa. This is Teresa right here. Now is Teresa, is that your? Dirty girl. This spot, this spot is for my, for my special lady, Leah. I'm gonna say that one more time. Leah, oh yeah. That's a sweet, sweet lady. Hey, uh, you polishing your trophies again? I, I. <laughs> that was great. 
Gotta love these farm families. <laughs> All right, Jacinda, <laughs> what do you got for us? <laughs> I don't think that's my slide. <laughs> These aren't my slides, so I'm just... <laughs> Are these your slides, Tom? No. Let's take a little break, see what happens. I'm Jacinda. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Got some nice shellfish jokes. Uh, yeah. Anyone got any shellfish jokes? <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> some buttons? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Are we good? Oh, no. So do you guys know how long it takes most of us Alaskans to grow an oyster in Alaska? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> All right, here we are. Um, so I am here for Hump Island Oyster Farm. My name is Jacinda Layton. I'm pretty new to the industry. I've worked for Hump Island for about two years in various roles. Um, right now, I'm the office manager and bookkeeper for the farm. Um, we operate out of southeast Alaska in Ketchikan. We have two operating parcels. So our smaller parcel up here on the map is 1.67 acres. It's on the Ketchikan side of the channel. And it includes our FLEPSI for growing out our oyster seed, as well as our cold storage for oysters, and then our processing area for packaging up our oysters for shipments. Across the channel, you'll see the highlighted larger parcel. That's a 15-acre parcel for our grow-out area where we cultivate and grow the oysters to maturity. Um, and that includes a float where we can tumble, harvest, and sort and clean up our oysters. Up above that float, we have an upstairs area for a bar for our guests and a gift shop for anyone that wants to come and visit our farm. I'll touch on that a little bit later, too. <coughs> It does take about five to 10 minutes to get across the channel. Depends if you wanna use the fast boat or not. Um, it sucks being in the skiff on a really rainy day, but I've done it and it's doable. <laughs> I swear I'm pressing it. There we go. All right. So I just have a bunch of pictures up here, so I'll just kind of talk about a bunch of our operations. Um, we introduced a FLEPSI to our farm in 2019. Um, a few people talked about a FLEPSI earlier today, and that's just for raising your really small, delicate oyster seed up to a manageable size to put in other um, aquaculture gear. So we buy our seed from Hawaiian shellfish. In the spring, it stays in our farm gear for the whole summer. We bring it across the channel, put it in our other aquaculture gear until it's ready to be sold. Um, some of that gear that we have for growing our oysters to maturity includes our rafts. Um, so we have these floating rafts with suspended stacks with um, wire mesh trays. And um, those can stack up to 10 high. And each raft can hold 7,500 dozen oysters. And we have 14 of those, so quite a few oysters can be held on our farm. And then last summer, we introduced floating cages to our farm. We have 150 of those. And they sit right on the surface, self-tumbling. Um, they're by Oyster Grow. Um, and that will be touched on later too. So our full capacity for holding oysters is 1.5 million adult-sized oysters on our farm, as well as three to four million seed in our FLEPSI. And the math probably is not mathing for that. <laughs> A lot of the seed does not survive, and we also do sell some of it to other farms as well. <coughs> um, it is also important to note, like, we are a bigger farm, so we need quite a bit of staff. Um, anywhere from two to 10 year round, but I say two in the winter time, there's not as much to do. In the summer during the grow out season, there's a lot more hands on tumbling and sorting of the oysters. Um, we also need more people to help with our tour operation. And so I'll kind of touch on that here too. Um, so we paired up with our sister company, Bonfire, Fa Bonfire, Bay, Bonfire Bay Tour Company um, in 2019. We started bringing cruise ship guests out to our farm Ketchikan gets a lot of cruise ships coming through. Next summer, we're projected to get 1.4 million visitors, so it's a lot of people from all over the world. 
Um, and so Bonfire Bay, who we work closely with, we help support them with staff, and it's also owned by some of the same people too. Um, we offer them a three hour tour slot. We bring them out to a farm, talk about raising oysters all the way from the flopsy stage to marketable size. And then they get to come up to that bar I mentioned earlier and get to try three oysters each. And then we even serve other kelp products, kelp salsa, hot sauces, and all sorts of stuff. And they get lots of time to ask us any questions about growing oysters. <laughs> um, if anyone doesn't know anything about oysters, I'm sure you'll have questions for us too. We have about 30 minutes with them upstairs to talk about the industry. And it, we get lots of great feedback. We've even had some repeat customers from the cruise ships, which I think is pretty awesome. People come on a cruise all over again just to come see us. So very good feedback. But yeah, thanks for having me um, from Hump Island. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jacinda. Next, we have Thomas with Seagrove on why Seagrove cho chose Oyster Grove. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Thomas James. I'm the on-site farm manager for Seagrove, and I've been with the company coming up on half a decade now. Uh, I would like to share a few, uh, or, or share a new development we've had on the farm and uh, a few of the observations we've made here. Let's see here. Get the little slide going up. I happen to have a spare copy of the presentation if you'd like it. Oh, there you go. All righty. So deciding which equipment to use can be challenging. Uh, here is how Seagrove decided Oyster Grow was a good fit for our operation. Initially starting as a kelp farm, we wanted to expand our inventory. Um, and while noticing the symbiotic relationship between kelp and oysters, um, it's pretty remarkable. Kelp, being photosynthetic, relies on nitrogen, among other compounds, to develop properly, and oysters produce nitrogen in their waste, so obviously it was the next step to take. We wanted to use a system that was easy to build, uh, use, and deploy. With those traits in mind, we used pre-assembled cages sourced from two separate manufacturers. Not only did this simplify our operation uh, for our experiment, labor costs were saved here on production. We tested two systems side by side, one cage floating and the other suspended at eight feet. Each cage was stocked with a density of 500 oysters for a total of 1,000. The test ran for a duration of nine months, with the suspended culture being removed after three months due to significantly less growth. After one quarter had passed, it was apparent that floating culture was superior to suspended in Doyle Bay. To save on our initial startup costs, the grow equipment was purchased in bulk and only partially assembled. We also bought the pneumatic tools used in assembly from Encore fasteners. Assembly training was provided directly from Oyster Grow in the form of training videos and on-call troubleshooting. Doing so, we were able to build our equipment in-house with no outside labor and reduced price per unit cost, as well as give the ability to repair our equipment on-site with minimal downtime. The ability to purchase a ready-made system that produces high-quality oysters is one of the main benefits of this system. While lantern nets and tray systems are cheap, repairs are often long and constant. Made of a plastic coated wire, the usable life of this system is about 10 years, giving you more time to recover your investment. Husbandry work is the, good, is the basis of good oysters. What we found most attractive about Oyster Grow was the ability to invert the entire unit in the water and use the energy of the waves to tumble your oysters, which is necessary for shape appeal and cup depth. In addition to those benefits, while the cage is in clean position, it simulates a low tide, uh, killing unwanted biofouling while conditioning the oyster's adductor muscles, a vital part of their anatomy. What we've noticed since implementing this system in our farm is that deployments are efficient, utilizing a bridle system provided by the company. On average, it takes a single person less than two minutes to install a cage. Furthermore, a team of two can deploy approximately 50 to 60 cages a day, and stocking seed can be handled by a team of two at a volume of 250,000 in an eight hour period. 
We have found that there is minimal dead loss with this system and the oysters produced are of high quality. And for the reasons stated above, this is why Seagrove chose Oyster Grill. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys so much. It's so interesting to hear about everyone's farms. Um, now we have time for questions. Uh, the audience can scan the QR code and ask a question and thumbs up existing questions that they'd like to move to the top. Or you can come up and take the microphone. Well, I'll just start out with asking you guys um, what have been your greatest farm challenges. As I asked before, how long does it take to grow an oyster? In Alaska, it's usually three to four years from the time that the grower plants their oysters. So you really have a long time of a lot of challenges as you go along throughout the you know three to four year process. I don't know if anyone, any of you guys want to start? Um, well, I will just say that um, I think too the challenge has been that yeah, now I realize that I can grow an oyster, but how do I grow a better oyster? I think that's the challenge next for my farm is how do I improve on, you know, there's a lot of what Thomas was talking about, husbandry work, um, and I think you, you know, can learn that from other growers, what's working for them, and um, so how to improve your product, and what's the end product that I'm looking for? Um, that's, that's been a challenge for me. A couple of the challenges that we've uh, found on our farm is uh, time management and effective labor use. Uh, you know, when you're growing at a high volume, uh, time is of the essence, and making sure that your every action you're taking is effective and useful um, has been some of our biggest challenges. Great. Um, I guess I'll take one from the audience. Um, Maida, you mentioned your season is 20 weeks. When is that season? Why is it so short? Is this the same for all farmers? Well, technically I'd say the tourism season and the season for handling really starts in mid-April or May when phytoplankton is in the water. And then come October, it becomes pretty blustery and stormy and the tourism season kind of dies off. So our peak season for selling, I'd say, is May to October. However, um, we'll still harvest through the winter, but we're not putting a ton of stress or strain on our oysters in the winter. We're not tumbling them. There's no phytoplankton, so we don't want to stress them out too much and cause unnecessary dead loss. Um, but for us in a town like Juneau, where we are heavily reliant on the, the sales from tourism, I'd say that's our peak sales, period. Um, can you provide details on PSP testing process? Um, I don't know if anyone sure. would like to answer that. I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so every time we harvest, we'll send out a sample, like the same day we harvest, up to Anchorage, and then they test it for you, and it's good for a week. And then you know for that week your oysters are good. They're not going to get anyone sick. Um, so then the next day after you get your sample results back, that's when you can actually ship out or give to rest or sell the restaurants too. So it happens every week. And there is another question um, asking if there's any way that we can mitigate for paralytic shellfish poisoning or toxins. Um, I don't think there is a way. <laughs> we live in a place where it's prevalent, and you know the most important thing for our industry is is to test um, and you know frequency of testing and to make sure that all farmers are on that same protocol. And you know, shout out to the uh, state of Alaska Environmental Health Lab in Anchorage. They are awesome. They have an awesome turnaround time for us. It's the only uh, lab in Alaska that is uh, federally meets the federal standard for. Um, you know, regulation, and so we have to have all the oysters that are sold in Alaska are, are well, all the oysters harvested in Alaska are tested at that one lab, and so, you know, it's, it's super important to us, and um, there's, there's just no way to avoid it. 
Yeah, paralytic shellfish toxins are naturally produced um, by Alexandrium, it's uh, algae. So when our shellfish intake these, they can obviously become toxic. I know most of you guys know that, but just a little refresher. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, we it can shut our farms down for significant periods of time and there's not much we can do about it. Um, all of our product, commercially grown product, is tested as C1 said, by the state of Alaska in the summertime, in the summer months for six months, we test our product weekly. So that's um, as growers shucking samples of oyster meat, sending them to the lab within you know a specified amount of time. And in the winter months, that goes down to once a month, we test for toxins. All right. So what is the market price for an oyster in Alaska and the U.S. and the international market? It's kind of a big question. Uh, and I'd say it's really broad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends. You want to find the highest value for your oyster, right? So try to find the most, the, the person that will give you the most money for your oysters. Like, but there's a lot of variability. I can touch on that a little bit too. Like for wholesale, you're gonna sell your oysters at a certain rate, but we also sell ours on our tour straight to the consumer. Um, I upped the price as much as I could. I wanna see how much I can get. Um, we were selling them for $40 a dozen straight to them. And there was no decline in quantity sold or anything. They were ready to eat them. So, um, but that's also like you're on our farm, you're in this romantic setting where you're like, this is a cool farm, I'm ready to eat oysters. So I don't know if you could sell it for that much in a restaurant, but. Wholesale, um, it's much less, much less than that. Yeah, like oysters in Alaska taking three to four years on the lower 48, it can be more like six to nine months. So like the investment for Alaskans to grow oysters is like so much higher than any other um, place that I'm aware of with, you know, our cold water. They grow a lot slower, you know, down Washington, they're, grown a lot faster so um, that too makes Alaskan oysters more expensive. Uh, I think we had a question in the back. Yeah thanks Weatherly. So thank you all for your presentations it's great to see more about your farms. I am excited to see the oyster grow being used um, and curious more than anything since um, like Sea Grove your installation is like the largest the only at scale installation of this product on the west coast that I'm aware of. So my question for you is, now that you have your oysters out planted in these systems and you're relying on not tumbling, which is obviously the point, are you seeing differences in different parts of the farm? Are, is that something that you're going to have to manage for? Um, well, really it depends on uh, the, uh, the weather. Uh, if uh, we're having really calm weather, um, we're noticing that they're not getting tumbling as much, but uh, because uh, we're in a, a nice, uh, Exposed spot, uh, the winter storms really help tumble those oysters good. So um, to answer your question more directly, we're not really noticing any difference throughout the farm. It's, it's fairly, fairly uniform. Thank you. Yeah, the oysters, especially Pacifics, they want to grow in clumps. They're, you know, grow on oyster reefs. And when you're growing them, they're just constantly growing together. So one part of oyster farming, I, no, you guys probably know this, but is um, tumbling, shaping your product, making sure they grow into singles. And uh, we all just handle our oysters um, so many times to keep them growing, you know, perfect as perfectly as we can. And so it's definitely a labor of love. Okay, other questions. Do we have issues with predators eating our oysters? If so, how do we mitigate? or prevent the predators. I could talk a little bit about that. Yes, everything loves to eat oysters. Um, you know, we have a lot of sea otters in Catchmack Bay. They love oysters. If they don't want to eat the oysters, you get, you know, larval sea stars setting in your oyster gear and they grow larger and larger. And if you get a sea star, you'll end up ending up with nothing but that sea star and a cage of empty oyster shells. Uh, anyone else want to add? <laughs> uh, 
another thing that uh, with our farm, uh, the cages uh, use a bag system made of a uh, durable uh, hard plastic um, with different mesh sizes ranging from uh, five millimeters to I believe 10, uh, just depending on your growth stages. And uh, those have really helped uh, stop a lot of the predation. Fortunately for us, we don't have as much uh, otter activity, um, but sea stars are definitely something we want to keep an eye out for. Um, on Hump Island, we get all, I mean, I'm sure on your farms too, you get all sorts of stuff growing in your stacks for biofouling. Um, one thing to help with oysters is actually sea urchins. They'll eat those little baby sea stars and even the little things that will grow the barn or the mussels on your cages too. So we'll actually sprinkle our cages with um, urchins anytime we see them. So that's like a one mitigation. It does not solve the problem. We still find plenty of starfish and mussels growing all over the place. <laughs> All right. Um, what is your greatest labor hurdle that people are facing? Ours currently would be uh, our uh, flipping uh, with the oyster grow system. Uh, part of it is flipping the cage into the open air to help kill the ballet fouling. Um, if you are, uh, that, that, that's what um, is our biggest hurdle right now currently. Um, I think our biggest hurdle is honestly just keeping people there to work. Um, and catch can, it's a very like highly competitive labor market. You have, I was just explaining earlier, like you have someone working at the zip line as a tour guide making just as much money than like a farmer that's going to get dirty out on the water all the time. So it's, it's really hard to keep people when there's a lot of other fun jobs available in the same area. Um, labor intensity, we still use our rafts a lot too, so we're tumbling all the time too. That's our most labor intensive right now, which is why we'd want to switch to oyster grow, and I'm sure flipping the cages is still a lot less than hand tumbling everything, too. Right. I think part of the challenge for farmers is definitely uh, efficiencies on the farm, so that, you, you know, like you guys are, have switched to this other growing method that, um, you know, is hopefully more efficient and going to do less labor, but, um, yeah, trying to find ways to, you know, improve your efficiency so that you don't need as much labor, um, but always you need some. And yeah, for me, it's the, I have a kind of a rotating crew. And like I said, I have a small farm. So um, just being able to pick people up who are enthusiastic about working on the water and whether they're coming off of another fishing season or they're in between research gigs or things like that. Um, you know, I really try to just uh, find other people who love to work on the water and want to pick up that work and get experience working on a farm. So there are a lot of people who want to check out oyster farming and see what it's all about. So that has worked out pretty well. And I would agree with you, Siwan, like maybe in improving the efficiencies, like we're out there doing manual labor and it's really hard and we have a sorting table for sorting and that helps a ton because we're able to stand at the table while we're working. but. If we get a mussel set and we suddenly have to be picking mussels and sorting them out of oysters and you're on your knees on the deck using your wire mesh to screen, like it can get really um, tiring on your back and your joints and your body. And so it would be nice to see certainly our farm improve some of those um, methods so that we are off deck more and on our feet more and, and not bending as much. Um, I'd say that would probably be our labor challenge. Great, thanks. Is there any advice you would give to new farmers? Stretch. <laughs> yeah, yeah pre-work stretch and flex, no. Um, I think when we started our farm, we, you know, we had really been advised, don't get in over your head, don't buy more than you can handle, just ease into it. Um, but then starting the farm in Juneau, um, there was this built-in market that was ready and excited about what we had. And I kind of felt like since starting our farm in 2018, we started our sales in 2020 and we have never caught up. And it, I think I would advise, like, look at your numbers, look at what you want for your business and, and where your profit margins are and buy enough seed out of the gate that you, when you are going to start selling, that you have enough sellable product to start making some money. Because if you start too small, then you don't quite have enough money to pay for those loans and those overhead expenses and the labor that you need. So 
it's a balance for sure. I think there's other farmers that would advise against too much seed as well. You know, I don't know that you want to be a single um, farm. I'm not, not a, I'm not a single mom, but a mom working with your kids with 3 million oysters first year. I think that would probably be overwhelming, but there is a balance in looking at the numbers um, and what your goals are for your business, I think is important. Yeah, so I think my um, advice to new growers has mostly been um, find other growers, talk to people, and get experience on farms. Like, I mean, I have, I've got people who come out just because they want to check it out. They want to learn how oysters are grown. And um, yeah, I did that um, at Jim Aguiar's farm before I started my oyster farm. Um, you know, Jim wasn't always the easiest to work with, but I really enjoyed being on his farm and I really learned a ton. And uh, I can't say enough about how much help he was to me and that process. And it, you know, through the Alaska Shellfish Growers Association, I'll just put a plug out there for ASGA, um, you know, meeting other growers, actually talking about problems, the, the water temperature, your gear, your, your anchor selections, just like all of the realities that you're dealing with, talk to growers. That's my advice. <laughs> okay. Um, is there a standard mesh size recommended for optimal growth? Does anyone? It varies. Like when you buy seed, if you're buying, you know, six millimeter seed straight from Hawaii or three millimeter or whatever the largest size you guys have, you're going to need some really fine mesh. And then at some point it becomes kind of impossible to manage the fouling. But basically, you have to match your mesh size with your size of oyster that's in there because you don't want it to turn into a salt shaker on the seafloor. Like, it has to stay in the gear. Um, and I'd say it has to stay in the gear and fit properly in the gear because even if it holds in the gear but all the little butts of the oysters are, like, stuck down in there and growing into it, then that's a problem. So if you have wire mesh that's on the larger gauge size and you're putting smaller oysters in it, you're going to want liners. Um, but you're going to want the right gauge of liners so you get good water flow. So it does matter. You don't just get to do a one size fits all. Certainly not on our farm. We have different size mesh for every stage of product. So when we get new seed, they go into baby bags. And then after, you know, six weeks, we go through and we um, divide it into bigger size mesh. And then all the way up until we're hardening for market, then it's in the largest size mesh so that we get really great flow without fouling and, um, and good wave action and stuff. So. Is there a way, Thomas, you combat uh, oysters from clumping in the oyster grow cages? Someone had that question. Actually, that's one of the main benefits of this system because, I mean, even on a calm day, it's still moving. They're still tumbling. Um, it really helps prevent dog earring and the clustering that you see. So um, not, I don't really have a challenge with that. You know, luckily, the, the equipment does it for us. Um, what makes your oyster that you're culturing unique? Well, I guess I would say personal preference, but um, the, uh, the cup depth and the fact that we get really clean oysters and we're not having to spend a lot of time to get that, you know, um, it's, it, it's, yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, all in Alaska, my oyster is going to taste different than your oyster, and that's just because of the different algae in the water. So everyone's going to be a little unique, of course. But what's really unique to like Alaskan grown oysters is it's really easy to see where your food comes from. I've had um, sh people that we've shipped oysters to say like some of the oysters were dead, and I'm like, okay, well I know who counted last week. I can like train them better, do something, and then I'll give them a discount. Like it's really neat, like working in a small industry like this to get that type of um, yeah, being able to talk about it is cool. Yeah, so um, I don't, unique about my oyster, I think, um, you know, what I, what I love, like I said, is selling the oyster, selling my oysters into my local community. And I think, um, yeah, oysters in different areas do have different flavors and, and there are some uniquenesses, but, um, you know, they're also very similar. But what's great is that 
people come into your community and they can have seafood that's grown in your local area. And I am I think that's awesome and I really want to promote that and I want people to have to come to Cordova or Prince William Sound in order to eat these awesome oysters from Prince William Sound. And you know, obviously we want to get bigger and we want to ship our oysters all over the world, but um, I also just I think that's the uniqueness is that that we we can be really local. I would agree with all of those statements. And then also, um, you know, when you grow an oyster, the things that you do actually do matter. The amount of times you touch it matters. The amount of times you wash it matters. The amount of sorting that you do matters. And I think that um, each oyster from each farm is a reflection of that farm's time and attention and effort they put into it. And if you um, have a farm that has oysters that grow passively on a beach, then you're going to have a different shape oyster with a different flavor profile and a different meat content. Or um, if you're growing in mud, you might have an oyster that is more prone to mud or in suspended culture system um, with a lot of freshwater influence, you might have a lower salinity if you um, have a lot of freshwater or a lot of rain. And I think that it can be impacted beyond just the amount of time and attention we put into it. If there is a majorly rainy season. Um, it impacts the salinity. Um, if you are in the mouth of a river, it impacts the flavor. And so um, it's more, there's, there's a lot to it. It's really complex. And I'd say that all of us have unique oysters based on our location, based on our handling and our techniques. Um, and there really is no one oyster that is alike, you know? Uh, and if you're in the mood for oysters, we are shucking oysters later from some of our farms uh, tonight. So hope to see you there. Thank you guys so much.